This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception and Action podcast, my interview with Jeff Fairbrother, Professor of Kinesiology, Recreation and Sports Studies at the University of Tennessee. Hi everyone, welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Jeff Fairbrother. Jeff completed his PhD in movement science at Florida State University and has been a faculty member at the University of Tennessee since 2003. He conducts research on a wide range of topics related to motor learning and performance. In the interview, we discuss the effect of repeated retention tests on learning, self-controlled feedback, the effects of a coach overriding feedback choice, and focus of attention strategies. Hope you enjoy! Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show. Okay, today my guest is Jeff Fairbrother, Professor of Kinesiology, Recreation, and Sports Studies at the University of Tennessee. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Jeff. Oh, it's my pleasure. So to start off with, like I always do, I wanted to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in sports science and motor learning? Sure. I think my background is probably atypical for people in the field, at least the ones that I've met. I started out in my undergraduate career as an English major, and when I graduated with that degree, I returned back to the area where I grew up, and I started getting involved in open ocean paddleboard racing. Okay. And that really got me interested in nutrition and training techniques and motivated me to go back and get a master's degree in exercise science. And during that program, I took a motor learning course and just became fascinated by the puzzle of trying to figure out what's going on inside the mind and the motor system, how people solve the problems of uh, movement performance. And I went to Florida State to get my PhD, focusing mostly on motor learning and control. And ever since then, I've just been an active researcher. Yeah, that is a little bit different. I guess you have the commonality. A lot of us seem to get into it to help our own <laughs> efforts to be an athlete, usually unsuccessfully. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was never anything more than middle of the pack, but uh, my brother was quite good. He's a he's a very uh, high performance type of individual. He's just one of those people that has always excelled. And I think what motivated me so much was knowing that I could never match his performance. I wanted to at least understand how it is that people get to that level. Mm -hmm. No, that's really cool. And I know that one, I was reading one of the first kind of topics or early topics that you worked on was the effect of re doing repeated retention tests on performance. And I never really thought about that as an issue. Can you tell us a bit about what you were studying there and what you found the effect they have on learning? Yeah, well, that kind of emerged out of uh, the work that I was doing with John Shea on practice schedule effects, random practice. And we were really looking at those, what are those structural factors that an instructor can control in the learning environment? And obviously how you present tasks is one, but another factor is how do you test people and how often do you test people? In the verbal domain, uh, Henry Rodiger, who I believe is now at Washington University in St. Louis, has has done a lot of work on uh, the benefits of repeated testing or what they call retrieval practice, showing that uh, it is actually a pretty good way to learn mm -hmm. um, declarative information. So we kind of took that and and ran with it and said, well, let's test this in um, in motor learning because so many of our our experimental designs had an immediate and delayed retention test. And we were wondering if, <laughs> if the delayed retention tests were being influenced by the immediate one. So the first study that we did in 2004, we just looked at a, a really simple timing task and we found that uh, repeated testing actually degraded performance um, compared to groups that uh, only took one test over the same interval. And then about six years later, I did a replication study here. I used the exact same task 
same procedures. Uh, the only thing that really di- differed was that one was done at FSU and this one was done at UT. And mm-hmm. we found that repeated testing actually benefited ah. performance. And, and so we were trying to figure out, you know, what was going on. One of the differences that we detected when we went back and looked was how proficient the learners were at the end of acquisition. Okay. And we found out that the participants in the UT study were much more accurate than the participants in the previous study. And this was consistent. Our explanation all along was that this this had to do with updating a memory representation for a task. Mm-hmm. And if you put these two studies together, I think what emerges is that if if the memory representation is strong and well learned, then repeated retrieval makes sense that it would benefit you because you're you're just rehearsing something that you're good at. Mm-hmm. But if it's weak and fragile, every time you retrieve it, you may bring it back with an error and then you update it with that error. So you basically encode an error in your memory representation and you just drift farther and farther away from the the target uh, of the task. And now clearly there's a there's very limited amount of research on this. It, it's really a, always kind of puzzled me why other people didn't pick up on uh, on this line of research because I think it's pretty fascinating and it's pervasive uh, in not only in research designs but how we train people in practical settings. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think you're right. We just somehow latched onto this 24 hour, whatever, one week or, you know, this kind of model where it's like really looking at the effects. And you're right. I've seen it with kids sometimes that are marching along, loving practice in whatever sport they're learning. And then even just the word test, <laughs> the coach says there's going to be a test on Friday, just makes them fall apart. Or, yeah. you know, so I think it's a really interesting area. So, well, I was going to say, but on the other hand, if you think about how we learn um, motor skills in informal settings, often it really is completely a series of mm-hmm. of tests. It's they're not called tests, but you're just trying and failing and figuring it out as you go along. You're not getting any feedback. If you look at uh, sports like skateboarding, where you know until recently it was largely just learning in the in the presence of your peers Mm -hmm. and you were just trying things and failing miserably (laughs) and so and and yet some people became remarkable skateboarders and so i think there's something to the fact to the to this idea of just you keep trying and trying so you're doing this repeated testing you're of course you're not calling it a test but Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly it's a it's a way to acquire a skill yeah no that that's really interesting so you're going to be looking into that a little bit more or yeah, we did a study a couple of years ago where we wanted to see if the amount of practice influenced it, but we didn't get really clean results. But I still would like to revisit that because I think that's a a good test of the idea that, you know, if you give more practice, they should have a stronger representation or, or acquisition of the skill. And does that then lead to a greater likelihood that repeated testing is going to facilitate later performance? Mm-hmm. No, that's that's really interesting. I have to look into that. And so another, I know another topic you've studied pretty extensively is self-controlled feedback in motor learning. So, what have you found in terms of when and why that benefits motor learning? Well, in general, the body of uh, research on self-controlled feedback shows that it facilitates motor learning. And what that research typically has done is taken one group and allowed them to choose if and when they receive feedback usually on a trial-by-trial trial basis. There, there's some exceptions, but for the most part, the trial ends and the participant has to decide whether or not they want feedback. And then they're matched to what's called a yoked control group. Uh, we know that when you allow people to choose when they get feedback, they surprisingly sometimes ask for very little feedback. We also know that reducing feedback facilitates learning. And so the yoked control group uh, controls for that reduced frequency. So both groups have the same frequency of feedback. Mm -hmm. And so the self-control research generally shows that um, there's a benefit to allowing people to choose when they receive feedback. And so what kind of things have you looked at? I know you've looked at kind of the role of autonomy and kind of other things with regards to that. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things in 
in self-control research is that nobody really knows why it works. Mm -hmm. Um, The two most prominent arguments hinge on, on the one hand, motivation, the other on information processing. I, I think both play a role, but I'm a little bit more interested in the information processing perspective. We've uh, tried to do some studies that have looked at the potential role of information processing okay. in self-control. We've done a, a number of different ones. Recently, the ones that have been, one that we just submitted is a extension of some work that Mike Carter and Diane St. Marie did mm-hmm. where they disrupted the KR delay period with a secondary task and they found that eliminated the self-control effect. Okay. And so, and so what we did was um, we extended that and we said, well, you know, that post KR delay, so that delay between when they finish the trial to when you administer the feedback or the KR Mm-hmm. Um, that's thought to be a period where people are self-evaluating, they're detecting errors, and they're possibly um, making a plan to correct that error. And so we thought, what if you took a task that was a continuous task rather than a discrete task, which is what most people use, and actually during those tasks you have online error detection and correction. We thought, what if you, you can't really disrupt information processing in that type of task, but you could introduce a cognitive load. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did was they did this task where they have two handles. They kind of come together in a V shape and then they control a stylus and you have to manipulate the handles to make that stylus go around a star track. Okay. And they do that as fast and as accurately as possible. And what we did so one combination was just self-control versus yoked, and we found a self-control benefit. And then the other combination, we had them um, do this cognitive load task where they had to guess a three-digit number, and it was continuous. So once they guessed one number, the next one came up. It was all verbal, so they could do it at the same time. And that made the self-control effect disappear. And we think that that combined with Carter and St. Marie's work on the care delay interval really points to a pretty compelling evidence that information processing is involved in the effect. Okay. So the the idea in, in kind of both those studies is the people are still choosing, so they still have the motivational what it, whatever effects, but you're not letting the kind of process as well, the results of their choice, uh, the information they're getting, that kind of thing. Yeah. It, yeah. The motivation. The, so, you know, I think it's really important to try to motivate people. I think as a mechanism, it's, it's a bit tricky because right now we can't, we can't set people's motivation at different levels and see what happens. We're always measuring motivation after the fact. So we don't really know if, if the studies that show motivation effects, if it's just a side effect of the self control manipulation or if it actually is a plausible mechanism driving the effect. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to me that the information processing perspective has a little bit stronger evidence, which doesn't, they're definitely not mutually exclusive. I, I think in all likelihood, both are going on. Mm-hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I saw that you had a really interesting one where you looked at, uh, was it looking at a coach kind of overriding the, the, the participants or athletes choice of when they receive feedback? Am I right in seeing that you did yeah. something with that? Yeah, we actually have two related studies that are are pretty similar, but they have some important distinctions. And it is, you know, as you know, I, I got my degree at FSU and, and uh, I was very influenced by the expert performance approach um, by Erickson and Smith. Mm-hmm. And um, Anders Erickson was on my dissertation committee. So oh. I was exposed <laughs> a lot, a lot to that. And so I've always tried to take the approach of thinking about what are the practical limitations of applying any idea that we're thinking about it and then working backwards to figure out how we can test that in the lab. And so at one point in our lab group, we were talking about self-control and I had a a former Olympic swimmer, a medalist who said, uh, how can you possibly implement (laughs) self-control in a practical setting? She said that even if the coach completely bought into the concept of giving autonomy to the athlete related to when to ask for feedback, in a lot of sports, they're just not available. So her example was, you know, she would be, she swam at Florida 
and she would swim a couple of lengths, be ready to receive feedback, pop her head up at the end of a length, only to find that her coach was at the other end of the pool deck working with <laughs> another swimmer. And so we basically tested that idea. We created a computer simulation with a simulated kind of animated coach and basically told people when they asked for feedback on a set number of those requests, we said the coach is not available. Um, and so just go ahead and go on with your next attempt. Okay. And it turned out that that didn't influence the self-control benefit. So, so that's good news that, uh, uh, the reduced availability didn't really mitigate any benefit of giving self-control. Mm -hmm. The the other kind of interesting side thing that we found was that it seemed to create a scarcity effect. The you know I said earlier that often self-control participants don't ask for feedback much. Mm -hmm. uh, in this study, they asked for feedback almost every single time they had the opportunity to. And <laughs> the only thing we can think of is that because we told them the coach was unavailable, they did some mental calculus to think, well, I better ask for it all the time because I never know when I'm going to get it. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so the other study that we did is, is the flip side of that. And we thought, well, what if, uh, you know, what if you convince a coach that giving an athlete autonomy is a good idea and they buy into it initially, but then they just can't help but override it when they think the athlete's making the wrong decision. <laughs> And th this was kind of, I had a doctoral student who was a rowing coach and he just couldn't get past the idea that it was the coach's job to give feedback and correct the athlete at all times. And so what we did then is we took that simulation that we made for the previous study and instead of saying the coach is unavailable, we just denied their request. And so if they, if the participant asked for feedback on a certain percentage of trials, we told them that we weren't going to give it to them and that they should just move on. And then if they didn't ask for feedback, we told them, no, we think you need feedback. And, uh, and that the results of that one are a little bit harder to interpret. We're still working on figuring them out because self-control facilitated performance in one measure of accuracy, but it degraded it in another measure of accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to figure out if there are some systematic things that we can further explore to, to tease that out a little bit more. Uh, obviously, that's it's a little bit more of a loaded paradigm because when you tell people, we think you need feedback, mm -hmm. that sends a bit of a social message that may be affecting the, the participant metacognitively other than just in this kind of mechanistic way related to the availability of, of uh, providing feedback. I think that that's really interesting work. If I really like that, I think I know talking to a lot of coaches that are kind of buying into this kind of self organization thing, the when to step in and when is a really tricky question. So I think it's really cool that you're starting to try to do some of that. <laughs> Sounds really fun experiment too. Um, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, another, another thing uh, I know that you've kind of, like you were saying, trying to get more at the practical side of some of the things that we do in the lab is that you've been doing a lot of is looking at the, you know, the classic issue of the focus of attention instructions and kind of challenging some of the, you know, quote unquote truths that are out there. So, um, so start off with that and that kind of what have you found in, in your research in terms of, you know, the benefits of external focus of attention? So I think most of our research has found that an external focus is beneficial. And I think that for me, a lot of it is that we sometimes stack the deck, so to speak, when we create our experimental designs, because we're, well, on the one hand, you know, we're comparing internal versus external in a control group, and we're not really considering this broad range of other ways that people may be focusing their attention. And so when you, whenever you create a you know, a dichotomous choice and you find evidence for one over the other, you may be missing everything that's in between. So even though we found in general a benefit of an external focus, we found some exceptions in some of our studies. And um, I just, when I think about the topic broadly, and when I think about my conversations with athletes and coaches, I have a really hard time talking to someone who's a, say, a world-class athlete who's not adopting the quote unquote ideal or optimal focus. And I have a really hard time criticizing them because, 
you know, that's their domain and they've achieved a high level of success. And I think it's, uh, it's maybe not the best idea for us to enter into that conversation telling them that they're, they're getting it all wrong. <laughs> so the one of the, I'll tell you about a, a study we just finished up. One of my doctoral students is a, I think now she's a six time world champion competitive jump roper. Mm -hmm. Um, she just won the female women's singles world grand champion in July. If you get a chance to ever Google that and, uh, it's pretty amazing some of the things that they do. But so she did this study where we looked at expert and novice jump rope performers and we used a task called speed jump roping where they adopt this, this bipedal gait. It's much like, like, uh, running in place. And then the goal is to jump rope as many times as possible in a set period of time. Uh, you should like a, you know, 15, 20, 30 second bout. And we gave them internal and external focus cues, focusing on their hands, on the handles of the rope, on their feet and the sounds of their feet. And what we found was that for the experts, any new attentional cue degraded performance over control. And that's actually consistent with at least three other studies, one that found that external focus didn't help professional balance acrobats, another one that looked at sprinters, and another one that looked at high-level soccer players and, and all found that the external focus was not beneficial for experts. I think if you think about an experiment, when you bring in experts who have spent years, sometimes decades, perfecting their skills and then bring them into the lab for, you know, half an hour and ask them to adopt a new attention of focus, it makes sense that it wouldn't be as efficient at the solution they had already arrived at. Mm -hmm. um, even if maybe in the long run, it could make them incrementally better within the time frame of the experiment. You can see why it maybe isn't, isn't good. So it's not a, it's not a, a, but I think, you know, it's not a magic bullet, obviously, to just come in and say, well, if we just shift your attention, you're going to, automatically do better. We don't see that with experts. The literature is very mixed. Mm -hmm. With the with the novices, what we found out found was that the cues that facilitated performance were the ones that were focused on um, controlling the rope. And it didn't really matter whether they were internal or external. It was focused either on the hands or focusing on the rope. Mm -hmm. And um, so we we argue that that it's I believe that it's conscious control that, you know, the argument has been that one of the explanations for the external focus benefit, the constrained action hypothesis is that by focusing externally, you, you, the performer doesn't consciously control their movements and that facilitates performance and that whenever they do anything that makes them consciously control their movements, it disrupts performance. I think that's probably true. I just am not convinced that that dichotomy between conscious and, and non-conscious control always lines up with internal and external. Mm -hmm. So in our study, it seemed to me, we were thinking about the whole body coordination of speed jump roping. And for novices, again, this is speculation, but it seems to make sense that, you know, the, the foot pattern is pretty close to a biologically driven gait pattern. Mm -hmm. And that probably takes care of itself. And so it makes sense that the limiting factor is how to control the rope to coordinate the rope with the feet. Mm -hmm. And so when the novices paid attention to the rope, they did better. When they paid attention to the feet, they did worse. For the experts, that whole package is one coordinated task that they've probably automated mm -hmm. um, as far as it can go. And so paying attention to any part ends up breaking that apart and uh, disrupting it, regardless of whether it's internal or external. And we did find, though, that the external focus on the foot sounds was the best for the novices. It just wasn't better than control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's really interesting. And I, I, I think there's a lot of good points there. And uh, I think you're right that, you know, you do need some sort of attentional control strategy, but kind of this dichotomy of either internal, external, maybe oversimplifying it um, in a bit. So, I guess the, the last question I wanted to ask you, Jeff, was about some of the, you know, what you have going on currently and, and some of the future work you're doing in your lab. So we're continuing to 
to look into attentional focus and self-control. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, Jared Porter just joined uh, UT. So he's oh. now a member of our lab. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty exciting because his research agenda and my research agenda align very well. And uh, I think it's going to give us some even more momentum to explore some of those ideas. I also have a number of collaborations with people across campus and even at outside units. So one of the things that's really pretty interesting is I'm a I'm a member of this brain computer interfaces community of scholars that we have on campus. And uh, we're one of the topics we're looking at is using EEG to control right now the the task is remote control cars or virtual cars. Oh cool. Uh, but ultimately the idea is to improve non-invasive EEG resolution so that you can essentially read a person's intention to act. So right now, the way EEG is often used to control devices is they use an evoked response to a visual stimulus. And so there's really an arbitrary mapping of an evoked response in, onto a, a control structure. So in other words, you say, if you look to the right and see the flashing light, we know that's going to produce a certain signal in your brain. The EEG detects it and algorithm says that means turn the car to the right. It's not the same as the performer just thinking about turning the car to the right, which right. would be the holy grail, right? Mm, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, so ultimately, that's the direction that you're looking towards that more seamless control interface where if you can get it sensitive enough to to have people just think about controlling the car and, and have it go where um, where they want it to go. They're a little bit more advanced when they use indwelling electrodes, mm -hmm. but obviously that has some application limitations. Not everybody wants electrodes um, inserted into their brain. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I know um, that that's work is starting to really make some advances. So that would be really cool to see. So this was great, Jeff. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Oh, it's been my pleasure. This has been uh, really fun. Thanks again for the great discussion, Jeff. You can find out more about Jeff from the links I posted in the show notes. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials including transcripts and an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Well, could you